Well, I really appreciate the invitation uh, to be here today, and I've admired this university for years, and it's exciting to see the growth and what this university provides to the students and to this valley and to the, the world, literally. And, and Sam, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate this. So hopefully I, this will be a benefit to you. Um, it's really hard to put together uh, something that, that may interest everybody. Um, my goal today is to give you an, an overview of what I do for a living. I'm often asked, um, do I like you know, my job? And I understand there are several pre-med students that are um, pursuing other uh, you know, disciplines in the physical sciences or um, biological sciences. I, I love my job and I, I've often thought about you know, why. I, as an undergrad, I really liked engineering. I majored in chemical engineering. And perhaps that's what attracted me to where I'm at now. And, and if I think of four areas of, of why my job fits my personality, I think it's the tools or the toys I get to play with. They, they tend to be you know, cutting edge and there's always something new to apply. I love the breadth of what I do. I get to deal with a lot of different organ systems, a lot of different pathology. Um, mostly, and something I appreciate more and more as my career goes on, is just the ability to serve and, and impact the life of somebody. And, and it's really, uh, the more I do this, the, the more humbled I am and uh, an honor I feel to really be able to play that role of, of being able to be in a small way, help somebody um, through a, a difficult situation. And um, that's what I like most about being a doctor, frankly. Um, the advances are always bright. Um, you'll, I'm going to conclude today by just with some words of encouragement, and I'll say it right now, that there's certainly a lot of talk out there about what's wrong with medicine, what's wrong with healthcare, what's going to happen with healthcare reform. Those things are irritants and distractions to me. Um, the bright side of this is that there has never been a better time to be involved in healthcare, in my opinion. Um, a, no better opportunities to help people to impact lives, and I think it only gets better. So, depending on why you're choosing the career you're choosing, I don't think you would be disappointed in medicine or potentially in the field that I am in. Just by way of my own background, and I put this up there just to kind of give you an idea of the years, because if you, if you chose to go into something like I did and you hated it, and you, you did it for some ulterior motive that was maybe you, you were impressed by somebody or you wanted to impress somebody or you just didn't really love the subject matter, and I think any of the PhDs in this room can attest to the fact that the journey can be a lot of fun. And I will tell you that some of the best years of my life have been going down this path. And that may seem like a lot long path. And often people will ask me, you know, how many years did you spend in school? And you, know, you start adding it up and it's mind boggling. And some, some days it might be a little depressing, wondering where all those years went. But for the most part, I have thoroughly enjoyed what I've done. And it's been something that, uh, of a source of excitement. And the years have flown by and it's really fun. But uh, anyway, that's kind of a summary. Um, I enjoyed, I have enjoyed the journey and, and still enjoy the journey. The other, th I would just make one other point that I think you have to enjoy learning. And that's the impression I get from the interactions I have in the advisory uh, board here. And it, it starts with Sam on down. Everybody loves learning that I've interacted with here, and it's fun to talk to the faculty to learn about new imaging in, in breast tissue or some other application. It's a fun environment here, and if you like learning, then also medicine is a good field for you because it's always going to be changing. So what are my objectives today? Um, it, I want to give you an overview of image-guided therapy. I throw imaging in there because image serves two roles for me. It provides a concept of structure and function. When most people hear the term radiology, you think of you know, someone's chest x-ray or a bone film, and, and that's important. Those have a role, but they, they define you know, osseous structures. With MRI, you can define ligaments and, and vessels. But imaging now goes far beyond that. It, you get into functional imaging. You can not only image structure, but you can image the actual living, uh, living physiology. And that's where it starts to get really intriguing because that helps you with patient selection. So, um, and then imaging guides what I do. Um, the interventional radiology is a bit of a, a misnomer. 
Image guided surgery perhaps is, is a better term for what I do. Um, but it really was an outcropping of, of the whole concept of doing minimally invasive work through imaging guidance. And we do both vascular and non-vascular applications. And I'm going to just give you a, an example of a few things we do. I love this quote. Um, there was a time when for many diseases people were simply observed and you crossed your fingers and you hoped for the best. You didn't have to assume as a physician much responsibility for the outcome because um, no matter what you did, it probably wasn't going to impact something to a high degree one way or another. Nature was going to take its course um, and that was that. Well now we have a lot of tools out there and that's only increasing and patient selection becomes increasingly important. And I love this where this quote where medicine used to be simple and ineffective and relatively safe. Now it's effective and relatively dangerous. You better be careful how you apply what we know and you make sure you have the appropriate indications. We were talking about that in a discussion over lunch and this whole concept of best practices and how do you, how do you promote good health um, in the country and utilize our resources. I think it really gets down to patient selection. The scope of my practice um, both deals with diagnosis and, and procedures and as I said imaging plays a vital role in diagnosing pathology. We have so many ways now we can look at the inside of a body in a minimally invasive fashion without having to open someone up. You can use MRI, you can use positon emission tomography, angiography, ultrasound, CT. I'm sure you've seen many of these modalities and, and I'm sure some of you in this room have had some of this imaging done. And then in minimally invasive surgery we both do things inside the vessel, that's where the term endo comes from. Um, I like to steer little tiny tubes called catheters inside of ple people's blood vessels and I can drive a catheter pretty much anywhere in your body. Um, I usually come in through the groin and uh, work my way up and I can go into the brain or down in the arm or down in someone's leg depending on where the pathology is. So in the vascular um, arena, we do things like stent, uh, we'll do angioplasty. If somebody has a blood clot, whether it's in an artery or a vein, we can infuse thrombolytics. For example, tissue plasminogen activator is a, is a medicine that we use frequently that facilitates the lysis of a blood clot and you can reestablish flow. Often we have to shut flow down. Maybe there's a tumor that's growing because it has too much blood supply or there's a short circuit called a vascular malformation and we can do things to shut those down. Um, sometimes people need access into their blood vessels to get medication longer term. We do that. Uh, we put in filters to strain the blood to prevent blood clots from going to the lungs in certain high-risk patients. And then there are some more exotic procedures like TIPS where you're actually decompressing, for example, the portal system in someone who has cirrhosis and you can create a new channel for blood throw through the liver. In the non-vascular side of things, we do a lot of pain management. If someone has a compression fracture in their spine, that can be treated by taking a, a needle and using imaging guidance, driving it down into, through the pedicle into the vertebral body and putting in a polymer that will solidify the body and take the motion out and therefore reduce pain. We do a lot of biopsies and, and drainage procedures um, in, in very precarious areas in the body. Sometimes people have trouble with their barrier system or their urinary tract and we can um, percutaneously, with imaging guidance, put in instruments that help decompress or reroute things while um, the underlying problem is being treated. Some of the tools we use, and this gets back to some of the toys we have, a lot of it's just catheters. And to give you an idea, I work a lot with different tubes and shapes. And you can use these along with a guide wire that literally, depending on the angle of the blood vessel, you can steer these almost anywhere in the body. Uh, for example, this configuration would be used to maybe access uh, a blood vessel that comes off at a fairly acute angle off the aorta. We use balloons for angioplasty, uh, stents, uh, we use laser technology, we use radio frequency technology, we use a lot of chemical agents. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of drug eluting beads, which are a resin where you can introduce a chemotherapeutic agent and then you can embolize a tumor and then you'll get a slow sustained release of that chemotherapeutic agent at the site of a tumor. So this is what I love because there's so many, there's so much technology, so many tools and, and things you can do. This is just to give you an idea. This is a, called an Amplatzer plug. Uh, there was a case, uh, someone uh, who was longboarding down Provo Canyon and uh, they had avulsed their kidney. They crashed into the guardrail 
and with such force, it just sheared, literally sheared the, the renal artery off their aorta. And I used one of these, they were bleeding, just to put in that pedicle, and it stops it immediately. Um, we also use coil technology. Um, it's a little softer, more malleable to treat other kinds of vascular problems. Here's some of the chemical agents we use if we want to seal down a blood vessel. That's a sclerosant that can cause scarring on the inside of the endothelium. Um, let's talk, I'll show you intermittently if just a few imaging modalities we deal with. This is MRI. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, these are sagittal images. MRI is um, useful in that you can, uh, as with a lot of 3D rendering, you can create a plane in any direction you want. Here you can see the corpus callosum. You can see uh, you know, frontal lobe, uh, parietal lobe. The anatomy is exquisite. And you can not only see structure, but you can characterize the tissue itself and see what's abnormal. <coughs> MRI is, uh, doesn't use, Im involve any ionizing radiation. It uses strong magnetic gradients. And the free protons in your body will process at a certain frequency called the Lamour frequency. And you can play with those variables and actually generate different signals that can be, uh, through a Fourier transformation, can be reconstructed into a 3D volume set. And so you can characterize the tissue and the structure of it. We use CT a lot. Um, it can also be um, reconstructed in multiple planes. This, uh, this is the heart. Here you have uh, a blood clot right here in one of the lower lobe pulmonary arteries. And you can see on a coronal plane, this is the same patient, just a different reconstruction of the data set, where you can see the same pathology here in the right lower lobe pulmonary artery. And that, that is a big pulmonary embolus, likely coming from the leg. We have other ways to image the blood vessels. We can introduce carbon dioxide. It has a very high solubility rate in plasma. Um, unlike air, which can result in trapping and, and actually block blood. CT angiography, which I just showed you, we can actually use magnetic resonance imaging to produce an angiographic image. And in this case, this is endovascular ultrasound, where you actually have an ultrasound probe on the tip of one of those catheters I showed you, and you can generate a circumferential image of the lumen of a blood vessel. And you can see the intima, the media, and the adventitia, and look at all those layers. So basically the way we approach this is um, we approach from the femoral artery you can, for, for an arterial procedure. You fill the pulse and then you put a needle in and then once you see backflow you know you, that needle is in the inside of that lumen and then you can introduce a wire. And then once you have the wire introduced then you can put in a catheter of a certain shape depending on what part of the uh, body you want to go and look at or treat. So here's an example of a basic endovascular approach to an atherosclerotic lesion. Here you have plaque buildup. We put a guide wire across it first. That acts as a, a smooth platform so we can introduce instruments across that stenosis atraumatically. This is an example of a balloon mantled stent that it, it's um, a, a stainless steel stent mounted on a balloon that then expands while the balloon goes up and then you re-expand the blood vessel. Here's a practical application. So you can see the curve of this catheter. So this is coming up from the femoral artery, common femoral artery. And this is a 67-year-old female with poorly controlled hypertension. This is the renal artery. And here it looks a, a little bit dilated. And that often occurs after a very tight narrowing called the stenosis. And this is neuroclusive. And what the, the kidney is a very interesting organ because it has a lot of functions including blood pressure control and if it senses through a reduced blood pressure gradient that the blood the effective blood pressure within that uh, arterial bed in the kidney is low then it stimulates the renin angiotensin system to increase your blood pressure and so you can go across that stenosis with these instruments that I showed you earlier and here you can see the balloon dilated with a balloon expandable stent and then you repeat it, and this was the before and after, and basically you eliminate that, that pressure gradient, and now the kidney can, the pressure transducer in the kidney more accurately reflects the actual pressure in the aorta, and you don't have this uh, uh, negative um, kidney balance. Cerebral vascular intervention is also an exciting area that we, we deal with. Um, we use some of the same tools that I've explained. 
more interesting areas that's evolving now that um, I'm involved with is stroke treatment. Uh, this is an example of someone who came in with dizziness. A 47-year-old, he, um, for someone this young, he had been a smoker, he had a lot of inherited risk factors for vasculopathy. And this is the uh, posterior circulation. This is the vertebral artery as it comes up and he had a, a stenosis. He, w he only had one vertebral artery that uh, provided flow to the back of his brain in the cerebellum and that was causing his dizziness and instability. So um, that was, I treated that with a uh, balloon expandable stent. Um, you first introduce a wire across it and then you can see the pre and the post result there and that helped alleviate his symptoms because he no longer had the hypotension when he stood up because he had better pressure gradient inside of his head. Sometimes a uh, patient can have what's called the subclavian still. Normally an artery coming off the aortic arch should look like this. This is the anominate artery, this is the left common carotid artery, and this is the left subclavian artery. And look, you can see it's uh, essentially occluded. Well, what happens in this situation is somebody could be used, if especially if they're left-handed, could be using their arm, and the arm actually derives its blood supply from the brain because it's going to come retrograde down the vertebral artery. You never usually think about that, that if you use your arm and you have a stenosis here, that somehow you could be robbing your brain of blood, but it can happen, and that's called the subclavian still um, syndrome. And so in this patient, he, he was uh, symptomatic. I put in a balloon expandable stent here and then took care of the gradient, and now instead of um, retrograde flow through the vertebral artery, he had antegrade flow. This is another vertebral artery stenosis. Uh, very tight narrowing here, and then after stenting, again in someone who had a dominant vertebral artery, they were compromised hemodynamically and, and were uh, dizzy and had instability of gait. There's been an evolution of options in the whole concept of stroke care. Um, in 1995, the uh, data for TPA administered systemically was published, were published, and it showed that in large populations, if you can come into the hospital generally under three hours. If you're given a systemic dose of TPA, your odds of you having a better outcome from your stroke are going to be improved. Well, since that time, we now have devices that can go up in the brain and selectively take out clot in with certain indications. It's been shown um, a lot of data that if you can revascularize a bed, there's going to be a higher chance of a good outcome. If, so, if you shut down a, a major artery in the brain, and this se I know this probably seems intuitive, but for a long while we didn't necessarily understand what this data is. But if you can revascularize somebody and open them up, the odds of them having a good outcome go, go up. Whereas if you don't, then their mortality um, is going to be increased. You can tell which vessels are, or predict which vessels are generally involved in a stroke by what's called the NIH stroke scale. And this is a quick assessment to let you look at the severity of a stroke. It's, um, if you have an NIH stroke scale of over 12, there's over a 90% chance that you're going to involve a proximal large artery. And these arteries aren't the ones that generally respond to intravenous TPA, or certainly just observation. And what do I mean by large artery? These are the arteries that right as you come out of the um, skull base, um, out of the cavernous sinus up by your, your eyes and optic nerves, these are the arteries that supply your brain. And you have, um, in this case, M1, which is the, middle, the main middle cerebral artery. You can have a clot proximal, a little more distal, or in, then you can have smaller clots um, in M2 branches, which are the bifurcations. We can now look at someone's brain and we can have an idea of whether that brain is just deprived of oxygen and needs to be, needs to have flow restored, or whether the brain has gone on to infarction and there's any restoration of flow would be futile. And we do that through perfusion maps. We look at three parameters. Basically, we look at the mean transit time, and this tells us how long it takes blood to get from the arterial to the arterial bed to the venous bed through the capillary and the venule face. And you can measure that by doing sequential imaging on a CT. We can also look at the blood volume, and this reflects the capacity of the brain to actually contain blood. These two parameters, when you integrate them, you can get the blood flow. 
The blood volume is our best predictor of whether something's infarcted or not. The mean transit time will tell you whether something is abnormal. So we first look at the mean transit time, we compare it to the blood volume, and if it's a mismatch, that would suggest ischemia, also called penumbra, and that that would be a patient we want to be relatively aggressive in. So here's an example of penumbra. So penumbra means brain tissue that's deprived of oxygen, but it has not gone on to complete infarction yet. So mean transit time is abnormally delayed, it's prolonged, and this is in the right middle cerebral artery territory. The blood volume is diminished, but only in a uh, portion here centrally, and it corresponds, if you can see, this is the right middle cerebral artery. Here is a normal left, and then here is a right, and you can see an occlusion right there. So um, what are our tools? Well, we can introduce TPA. We can put a, a catheter up there and try to dissolve it. Um, we can also go up, uh, and that's what this case is. We thread a little catheter, and this is about the diameter of uh, a thin strand of spaghetti. And again, you're coming from the groin. You build a scaffold to give you stability in the carotid artery, and then you can take this small catheter up into the brain, and you can bathe that area with TPA and dissolve the blood clot. So this would be someone after you've been able to restore flow in that, in that arterial bed. This is a patient uh, where there's a complete occlusion of the M1. There should be a large vascular bed here that you're no longer seeing. And then after treatment, you can see it open up. Um, CT scan is good for uh, looking at early changes. This is a very early change of infarction. And sometimes it can be a little bit hard to, to pick up on just a non-contrast CT. That's why the perfusion imaging is very important. That would be early, this is late, and this is what we try to prevent where you have an infarct, in this case, um, a left middle cerebral arterial bed. Stroke's a devastating disease. It's one of the leading causes of death and disability in the US. It's probably one of the most feared diseases of anyone in the elderly population because um, it can leave you so disabled if you do survive. Where I think this is heading in stroke therapy is our ability to select which patients are going to benefit and which aren't from our therapies. And it all hinges around this ischemic penumbra. So in acute stroke, um, we, use func we use structural imaging, we use functional imaging, and we can actually use angiographic images from the CT to help decide what's going on and causing this. And through some of these parameters, the blood flow is simply the blood volume divided by the mean transit time. And I'll just show you a few examples. This is a match defect. So mean transit time is delayed. However, blood volume here is also abnormal. The capacity of that brain to actually contain um, uh, contrast within its vascular network is diminished. And when you have this match, there's no reason to go after this clot here in the left M1 because that brain tissue is already dead. This is a, a study of, a, or a case we did of a 36-year-old male he um, unfortunately had a lot of inherited risk factors for vascular disease, including um, um, some acquired ones, such as smoking. But while he was at work, he, there was a witnessed event, and this was early in the morning. It was witnessed, EMS was dispatched. He was at our hospital within about 30 minutes, he had arrived at our ER. A stroke team was paged. Um, within about an hour, he had had a head CT. He then, um, is identified as having a large vessel occlusion. So he comes to um, our department and we start a procedure on him. We give him a total of nine milligrams of TPA. We also use one of those devices that helps us extract the clot. And then he was transferred out of our um, area after we had revascularized his uh, middle cerebral artery. And he spent four days in the hospital, two days in the ICU, two days on the floor, and he went home intact. Here's his imaging. So his mean transit time was delayed. This is a right middle cerebral artery territory. His blood volume though looks perfect. Everything's symmetric here. So this would suggest penumbra. It's um, tissue that's starved of oxygen but it hasn't gone through infarction yet. Here was his angio. It shows an M1 occlusion. And then this is after retrieving the clot and giving some TPA and using a device to extract the clot, you have restoration of flow. Here's another study, a 74-year-old female, history of hypertension and congestive heart failure. She had acute onset dysarthria. She had trouble speaking while she was on the phone with her kids. Mean transit time, delayed. Now you start to get the rhythm. 
you'll be able to interpret these by the time we finish the lecture here. Um, the, the cortical bed is actually maintained. There is a match here though, and that's in the basal ganglia. So there's a portion of this that's matched where she's already infarcted, but the majority of that arterial bed is preserved and there's still viable tissue there. So we gave her intraarterial therapy within three hours and she also had a four day admission. I wish all of them would go this well. They don't, I don't mean to imply that at all. I just wanna show you the potential of this. Two days in the ICU, two days on the floor. But what was interesting, we could have predicted this infarction right here because we saw that on the blood volume map right here and her basal ganglia was the only area that ended up um, being infarcted and she was able to uh, within a couple months actually drive herself to her own neurology appointment. Here's another st um, case, a 80 year old male, hypertension, congestive heart failure who had intermittent left hemiparesis. So the mean transit time, excuse me, mean transit time was down, uh, blood volume relatively preserved. Um, and this is a case, just uh, I'll just show you that, um, you know, again, this would predict uh, penumbra. Um, given the age, you would want to take into other comorbidities, but these are the kind of targets we want to go after because we feel like the highest yield <coughs> of outcome is going to be with someone who has a mismatch. We also do a lot of um, peripheral thrombolysis. Um, if somebody has a problem with their blood vessels in their extremities, for example, here is the aorta, and then you have a common and external iliac artery. On this side, it's occluded. We can actually um, often get through those types of occlusions and reopen them and with stent and angioplasty revascularize a bed like that. Let's talk a little bit about venous disease. Uh, very important, um, obviously a much lower pressure inside the venous bed than the arterial bed, and there's a different set of problems. Sometimes we have to dissolve a blood clot inside the venous bed. Sometimes we have to prevent blood clots from going to the lungs, and we do that with filters like this. These filters aren't without complications, however, and so when we put them in, we want to be cautious about our reasoning of why they went in, and also, if they can come out, we want to get them out as soon as a patient no longer has that risk factor. In some cases, unfortunately, a filter has to stay in for life and, and we deal with it the best we can. In patients who develop blood clots in their legs, often they will get a stagnation of flow later on because the small valves inside the vein are, are damaged and you develop tremendous hydrostatic pressure at the level of the ankle and, and the calf. And this is called post syndrome and you actually get a, a staining of the skin and you get scarring underneath the subcutaneous uh, tissue and the subcutaneous fat that's called lipodermatosclerosis. But this tissue, ironically, is starved of oxygen because the, the blood flow is so sluggish through there and these patients will often develop ulcerations. In many of these cases, had they had their blood clot dissolved or extracted when it first happened, you would not encounter that sequela. And these can go on to ulceration. In fact, this was a 40-year-old gentleman who had seen us who had three years earlier had, had a blood clot in his leg and now had to deal with this ulcer because he, he had just undergone anticoagulation, but he had a heavy clot burden centrally that never recanalized, never opened back up. This is a case of a 22-year-old female that I treated. She was, um, it was the week of her wedding, n you know, never a good time to have a blood clot, but here they'd invited guests and from everywhere and she had uh, swelling in her left lower extremity. She also had some chest pain, even though we never diagnosed pulmonary emboli, but that's one thing you'd want to worry about. But she had an extensive thrombosis throughout her common and her external iliac veins with a little bit of involvement of her inferior vena cava. She had a predisposing factor called a Leiden-5 deficiency. It's a mutation. Um, and this pathologist who lived in the uh, 1800s described the triad that has to occur generally for, a, for someone to get a DVT. Usually there has to be trauma, some underlying predisposing factor, some inheritable, inheritable thing, um, and it's called the Virco triad. And for those of you who go to medical school, you learn more about this, but there's often an endothelial injury that can be from surgery or trauma. You get stasis, maybe somebody's been on a long plane ride, um, or maybe they're immobile after having surgery, or they have congestive heart failure and increased right-sided heart pressures aren't allowing enough 
venous return, or you can have hypercoagulable states, such as oral contraceptives or other hypercoagulable states. Sometimes they're acquired or they are inherited. We did what was called a pharmacomechanical thrombolysis, and this is actually a device where there's a balloon here and a balloon down here, and in, in, interposed between those balloons is a wire that agitates in a sinusoidal pattern that agitates the clot and, inc and lets us put in TPA and allows the, PTA, the TPA to penetrate deeper into the clot. So effectively what you're doing is increasing the surface area of activation for the TPA and you can clear that clot up. And this was this, so these are some of these devices that we use. Um, but this was after we had cleared the clot up, she had a, a narrowing there, um, actually caused by the superimposed right common iliac artery, and we had to stent. But she's now a, a pediatric nurse at Primary Children's Hospital, and is now five years out from this and completely asymptomatic. Sometimes people will have abnormal short circuits of blood vessels in, in their, uh, vascular bed. And this was a 31 year old uh, patient that I saw and he just had this achiness down around his rectal area and um, fortunately no one biopsied it but on rectal exam it was a pulsatile mass. He was born with this and what this is right here is a short circuit where he went from a large artery to a large vein and you all know what happens when you short circuit wiring, right? The circuit breaker trips well, in your body, if you short circuit like that, you can get high output failure. So a 31-year-old person who, who, who goes undetected with this could present at a later age with high output cardiac failure. So I used a coaxial technique to treat this. I used actually um, several different catheters. I used a, a 9 French, which is a larger outer size, and then I went selectively smaller so that I could position myself to treat this. This was the initial angiogram, um, and this shows the, uh, the vascular malformation, and this actually got more blood supply than his left leg, this short circuit in his pelvis. I went over the top and then used a balloon uh, tip catheter to occlude flow and then went down with a smaller little catheter into what's called the nidus or the center of this vascular malformation. And then I instilled some alcohol, absolute alcohol, which denudes the endothelium and causes this to scar down. It causes a coagulation necrosis. And then afterwards, you can see the vascular malformation is gone and you eliminate that vascular bed. There was no normal tissue being supplied with that, which was fortunate for him. Sometimes that's not always the case. We can also do embolization of various types of tumors. In this case, this is a uterine fibroid. These are benign but can lead to anemia and heavy menses and we can put small particles in the range generally of about three to seven hundred micron depending on the application and these will migrate into the vascular bed of these tumors and allow them to shrink. Um, here's a, an exciting example of how imaging can guide therapy. Uh, you've all probably heard of PET scanning. Um, here you have an 18 isotope of fluorine with fluorodeoxyglucose, and this can be used to image metabolism. Here in the right hepatic lobe, you can see a bright spot where there's increased metabolism. This is a patient who has a hepatocellular carcinoma in the, in the liver. And so PET allows you to identify that because sometimes without that, these images can be, or these um, lesions can be quite subtle. And basically you get um, gamma photon emission and then you have a circumferential photomultiplier that can give you a 3D data set that can be reconstructed. And so you get anatomic and functional imaging from this. I just throw this up there to show you some of the tools that we can use for treating liver tumors, um, whether they're metastatic or primary. So here is the inferior vena cava, you have the portal venous system, and then this red is, are the hepatic arteries. We can go in through the hepatic artery in many cases and do an embolization. And the way that occurs is we, we drive a tiny catheter into the area of the liver um, that where the abnormal tissue is, and there's usually an abnormal vascular bed that's providing blood supply to that tumor. And we can put in drug-eluting beads that are coated with typical chemotherapeutic agents, which offer a sustained relief. And so you create stasis, and you, cr and you deposit these drug-eluting beads within the tumor, and you can get local chemotherapeutic effect. This is called TACE, or transarterial chemoembolization.
And so here are the cartoons. This is actual what happens. You can see a catheter um, selecti selectively going into the vascular bed. And then after the drug eluting beads are put in, then you can see that that tumor bed is devascularized. So you're really um, facilitating treatment of the tumor in two ways. You're depriving it of oxygen through depriving its blood supply, but you're also um, depositing a high concentration of chemotherapeutic agent in that vascular bed. We also can treat tumors in various locations, in this case a liver, through radiofrequency ablation. Here is a large hypervascular tumor demonstrated by CT, and after treatment, several months after treatment, using a radiofrequency probe where you put in um, a probe that has a predictable pattern of radiofrequency energy deposition, you can see just a, a hole, basically, that, you, that um, this tumor was devascularized or or basically ablated. Um, sometimes we use stents to treat uh, iatrogenic or vascular malformations, or in this case, somebody who had had a, a catheterization and they had a shunting between two blood vessels that was causing a lot of swelling in their leg. And so we come in from the other side, come across the top with a wire, and here you can see a, a stent that's been placed. And that is a covered stent that basically excludes the, uh, the flow between the artery and the vein. Here's a 25-year-old male with a varicocele. These are like varicose veins that can occur in the scrotum. They can be painful. Sometimes they can be associated with infertility. And these generally come off the uh, left testicular vein. So this is inside the vein. You can come down and you can deposit coils into that vascular bed and basically eliminate the source of where that varicocele comes from all from a little incision in the neck coming down through the jugular vein as opposed to an open surgical procedure. Once in a while we're called on to do crazy things like maybe retrieve a foreign body that's um, dislodged and, and embolized. This was a 13-year-old girl with non-Hodgkin lymphoma who had a pick line, a central line that had been in for several weeks. And when it was removed, only a portion of the line came out and the other portion of it was in the main pulmonary artery here straddling the right and the left and, you know, obviously, you know, the implications of this are huge because this is a nidus for thrombus. It's um, a nidus for potential infection. It's also something that would be not easily treated if you wouldn't, couldn't go in through the inside the blood vessels and, and retract it because it would require an open thoracotomy. But um, here I went in with a snare and was able to uh, snare the tip of that and then pull it out here. So sometimes we, we have to take care of problems that uh, we, we cause ourselves um, trying to treat other diseases. One other thing I'm just going to wrap up with is some, is some non-vascular intervention and it deals with compression fractures, vertebral body compression fractures. As we age, uh, we become a little more osteoporotic and sometimes even insignificant trauma can result in a compression fracture and many times in the elderly population a compression fracture is basically a death sentence because you become bedridden, you can develop DVT like we talked about, that can lead to pulmonary emboli or pneumonia and, and basically the quality of life severely diminishes. These can be detected through MRI, here you can see some fractures in the mid to lower thoracic spine and we basically do an intervention through the pedicle where we can take a uh, a needle and advance it into the vertebral body and inject polymethylmethacrylate. And this actually in, um, extends through the trabecula of the bone and tightens it up and takes out motion and can prevent further collapse. It's the motion that's really causing the pain and the disability, but it can be the collapse that can also cause compromise in respiratory function. So um, that should give you an idea of some of the, the vascular things and the non-vascular things we can do. There are a lot of other procedures we do. Um, there are certainly are a lot of challenges in medicine on the horizon, but at the same time, I think on the brighter side, there are huge opportunities. And never have we been in a situation where we can do more good uh, and uh, apply the large body of knowledge that uh, has been acquired collectively in this field over the years. So in summary, I, I hope this is giving you a, a better idea for what I do for a living. Um, the whole concept of image-guided intervention, uh, both functional and structural, and how that allows someone to, to very precisely put various instruments and, and target certain organs or various pathology in the body and have a positive impact. 
And again, I just, uh, it's a, just a huge opportunity and, and honor to be able to uh, potentially impact someone's life in a positive way. Thanks.